Uh, good afternoon. I prepared a, a presentation, but uh, yeah, you can ask me more questions. So uh, first, I, I would like to give you a bit an overview of what energy cooperatives uh, were and are and been are doing in 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 Europe, and then I will come to the the new directives uh, more at the end of this presentation. And uh, yeah, let's say you can always ask questions. Maybe it's better to do them afterwards. Uh, write them down, and and uh, and then we can start with the Q and A. So um, I, uh, you will notice that on each slide, I I wrote down uh, with the logo of Interreg Northwest Europe. That's a European program for Northwestern Europe. And we are part of the ECHO project. And when I put the logo there, I can, uh, I can uh, validate it as one of the master classes. And so I can also validate the hours I spend on, on making the presentation and so on. So that's, uh, that's why. Actually, the ECHO project is, is interesting because for the first time, we work as a federation of energy cooperatives. We work together with a farmer organization and the idea of this farmer organization in Belgium, uh, Burenbond, a very rather conservative organization, uh, uh, their idea was uh, farmers have land, they have roofs, they have tools uh, and they are disconnected from their neighbors uh, because they pollute and they, they do things with animals uh, some people don't like and uh, they spray uh, insecticides and fungicides. Well, their idea is to reconnect with their neighbors through uh, energy production and setting up rural energy cooperatives. So for us, it's, uh, it's an interesting journey. And well, so far it's, it goes well. So that about this echo uh, thing. So who is uh, RESCOP EU? RESCOP stands for Renewable Energy Sources Cooperatives and EU for the EU. So it's the European Federation of Citizen Energy Cooperatives. Um, there are about, we represent about 1500 of them, uh, although we across Europe, uh, we um, estimate that there are more than 3500 now. Um, our federation was created in end 2013, so we are quite young federation. Uh, we have nine employees. Uh, we have a board where there are eight members, which are either federations of cooperatives or uh, cooperatives themselves. Um, so, and these 1500 energy cooperatives, they represent or more or less 1 million European citizens. Um, so, um, what do we do? So, at the European level, um, here in Brussels, so I'm not in Brussels now, I'm uh, 35 kilometers from Brussels at home. Actually in, uh, in the place where uh, my cooperative EcoPower was created uh, uh, in 1991, it's an, it's an old water mill and uh, a national monument. And I'm not an engineer at all, I'm a linguist actually, and, but in the 80s there was not a lot, lot of work and I started volunteering for an NGO that wanted to restore two uh, industrial water mills. And since there was a turbine here uh, and it was a monument, we had to restore the turbine. And they said, well, it used to provide the whole village with electricity from 1907 to 1947. And so we have been restoring the turbine and that's how I became, it seems, one of the pioneers of renewable energy in Belgium and Flanders. So that's how, so I'm now in the middle. So at the European level, uh, we, we uh, do advocacy. That's the, that's the clean word for lobby. Yeah? We, we do lobbying. Uh, I have an official lobbying card to enter the European Parliament. So every time I go in, there's a, it is counted yeah? and also who I meet and so on, which is a good thing. Yeah? Uh, we um, we work on financing uh, 
for our members. This is a, a, a problem mainly for starting uh, initiatives. We network among, uh, among members so that they can share good and bad practices so that we don't make the mistakes or one, everyone makes the same mistakes. We uh, are developing services for our members um, and um, these, uh, we have working groups on IT, on electrical mobility. We promote the, the RESCOP model and we help startups. So these are all things we do. Um, so uh, what do these energy cooperatives do? Um, so it's not all cooperatives. Uh, so uh, a cooperative uh, society is a legal entity. Uh, depending on the country where you're from, it might be in in the law. It can have different uh, definitions. Uh, but for us as a federation, we consider uh, citizen energy cooperatives groups of citizens who cooperate in the field of renewable energy or energy efficiency. Uh, it might be on production, supply, distribution, storage, services, uh, electric car sharing, whatever. Uh, but regardless of the legal entity, uh, we, um, in our charter, we have a charter. They, uh, besides our own accents, there are also the International Cooperative Alliance principles. And uh, these are these principles. Huh? So it's voluntary and open membership. You can't force anyone to become a member of a cooperative. Uh, this uh, principle was violated in Eastern Europe during the communist area, era, era and, uh, but also in Greece, for instance, where the ruling party put their people on top of every cooperative and they even forced people to uh, become a member of a farmer's cooperative. So it is something uh, coming from people and uh, it's open and voluntary. Uh, it is a democratic organization. Uh, so uh, uh, this means that it, there's not a boss and, and everyone has to, has to agree with him. No, it's uh, typically it's one person, one vote, regardless of the number of part of uh, shares uh, you have. Uh, the members participate economically. So it's not only about putting some money together and doing something, but uh, when it's a cooperative, preferably, it's not only uh, bringing money together to, to build a wind turbine, but also to, uh, to buy the electricity from this wind turbine. And that's the ideal. Um, these are these legal entities, these, these cooperatives, they are autonomous and independent. So they are not under control of a, a big private company, for instance, or they are not under control of uh, a public uh, authority. So we actually, we, we consider ourselves as a third player in the field. So Normally, it's only two dimensions, public and private. So we consider ourselves as a, a third player. Huh? We have certain aspects of the uh, private players, but we also have certain aspects from the public uh, authorities. Huh? So um, cooperatives, it's, um, we, uh, it's very important that we educate and train our members huh? and the general public in, in, in general. Um, we don't compete with other cooperatives. No, we work together. And uh, we don't only care about our members, but also uh, for society as a whole. As a whole. So this last uh, uh, aspect could also be translated into we care for the environment, for uh, we are against climate change and so on. So um, what are the benefits of these citizen energy cooperatives? So um, it's uh, acknowledged also by the European Commission now 
that uh, when people can uh, can uh, invest in, for instance, a wind turbine uh, in their neighborhood and they own it, that they accept it in their neighborhood. And so when, uh, because the money, the profits are kept locally and can be used in the local economy to foster the local economy. Uh, it, so it brings benefits to the society as a whole. Uh, we, uh, if we are a supplier, we supply the clean energy at cost, at a reasonable cost. We don't have to make profit. It's uh, not for profit. The profit is not the aim. Uh, it's uh, green electricity at, at the lowest possible price from our own country. Uh, that's, that's rather the aim. Uh, we can also, as uh, local energy producers, we can, and as con local uh, consumers, we can provide flexibility to the grid uh, if, uh, if it is allowed. And we also help our members save energy. So uh, even though we are a supplier of electricity, for instance, we don't, uh, we, we are very glad if they, if they consume less, you know, so then we can supply more people. And so the, the picture on the right here, I, I hope you see my cursor. Do you see my cursor? Yeah? Yes. Someone not? Yes. So you see, this is the, an example from my cooperative. So in this, in this uh, small city, 20,000 inhabitants, we have installed five wind turbines and all the, the yellow uh, pins, they are members of our cooperative in this uh, city. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, if we build a new one, we recently built a new wind turbine, there was not one objection to our project. So because they know the return stays local. So um, on our website, you can find a map uh, where these energy cooperatives are situated. Um, beware, not all of them are there. Uh, the cooperatives have to put themselves on the map. Um, but you immediately see that it's more something of Northwestern Europe than of Southern Europe, and especially it's more something of Northwestern Europe than Eastern Europe. So um, the, that's one of the big challenges we have as a, as a European Federation is to, um, to uh, spread our model to the whole of, uh, of Europe uh, so that people everywhere have the same opportunities as we already had in Northwestern Europe. Um, yeah, so there are some, some interesting examples. Uh, um, for instance, in the UK, um, one of our board members is Energy for All. Actually, it's a sort of developer or, or uh, yeah, developer of energy cooperatives. Um, you, we also noticed that um, the support mechanism or, or, even, or it could be also a fiscal support system in a certain country can lead to the fact that people adapt their initiative to these legal or fiscal circumstances. So in the UK, this led to the fact that the energy cooperatives there, well, they're, they're not always cooperatives, and they have a very, uh, I, a lot of uh, legal entities uh, at their disposal. And there are uh, BENCOMs, they call it, benefit for the community, societies or something. And um, so there we have more project cooperatives. So, one wind farm is one cooperative. Uh, and when they install solar uh, panels near the wind farm, it's another cooperative. So it's more like project cooperatives. And this has fiscal reasons. Uh, uh, um, so this Energy for All, I think they created 27 or 28 of these cooperatives uh, now. And they, they, let's say they service them. And, and they are, and Energy for All is owned by these 28. Uh, cooperatives. So it's a sort of technical, financial, uh, legal entity that uh, helps their members uh, or their owners, I should say. So it's a sort of cooperative of cooperatives. Um, 
Sifnos, that's uh, a Greek island. Uh, there's a, a, an energy cooperative. They want to install a pump storage uh, a system with four or five wind turbines. Uh, they uh, they try to tackle all the the obstacles there are or there were in Greece. And after six years, it seems they are close to getting their permit. But I have to see it first. Um, because there is still a state monopoly, actually a state monopoly in, in Greece uh, for distribution. Uh, the photo on the, on the left, that's an interesting example in Germany where the local energy cooperative, uh, when the football team uh, went to a higher uh, category, I don't know the word, the higher league or something, they had to uh, have uh, covered uh, uh, space for their supporters. That's a, was a, they were obliged to have this, and so the investment was done by the cooperative with solar panels. And so the supporters of the football club could invest in the solar panels and and also in the roof above their heads. So these are interesting things. It shows also that um, often energy cooperatives with the profits they start doing things besides energy as well. There are examples of energy cooperatives building a kindergarten for the municipality where they, where they are active, uh, things like that. And the photograph uh, with the wind turbines, the offshore wind turbines, is, this is one of the most uh, used uh, photograph of an offshore wind farm. And what's interesting, it's uh, just outside to, uh, out, uh, outside the coast of Copenhagen, and I think 24 wind turbines, if I'm not, not mistaken, half of them owned by the, the Citizen Energy Cooperative of Copenhagen, Middelgrun, and half by the public utility. Uh, in a few years, they will be replaced, and the city of Copenhagen uh, uh, demanded, or, or you say, uh, they, they really wanted that. It, uh, the wind turbines would be replaced in the same constellation because they consider it as their Eiffel Tower. Huh? So, uh, some of our members are, uh, most of them are, are producers of renewables with solar, with wind, uh, with hydro eventually, but um, uh, some of them are also suppliers or are producers and suppliers. And this is the case of my, my own cooperative, uh, EcoPower. Um, we started here in the mill with nine people in 1991. And now we are very close to having 60,000 members. And we produce about 100 gigawatt hour of electricity every year, which is enough for them. Uh, and we supply them uh, with this electricity at cost. And if there is a profit, we, uh, we give our members a dividend. Uh, for last year, the proposal of the board is to give them 2% of dividend. Um, the, um, in my cooperative, the share is 250 euro, and uh, the average shareholder has four shares, so average is 1,000 euros. But most of the members, 75%, only have one share of 250 euro. So they're not really into it for the dividend, but rather for the electricity, green electricity at a reasonable price. We have Enostra in Italy, which is a new energy supplier in uh, the t-shirt of Somergia. It's one of my favorite t-shirts. Uh, Somergia has now more members than EcoPower, although they're uh, younger. Uh, we have more than 65,000 members now. Uh, we have an Aircop in France. Uh, we have uh, Cositer in the French part of Belgium. And so these are all suppliers. Some of them are also producers. So, so we also um, uh, have quite a lot of our members um, help their, their members in saving energy efficiency. Uh, so we, we develop energy eff efficiency services. Um, uh, we help them in re to renovate their building. We organize uh, group purchases for insulation, for 
solar panels, solar boilers, uh, double glazing, triple glazing, whatever. And um, by doing this, we try not to, and some of you uh, were interested in energy poverty. So I see more and more that our members are very much concerned that they leave no one behind. So that, uh, that we, there's energy poverty is real, even in Belgium, which is a rich country. Uh, it seems that about 10% of the people have problems paying their bills. And so we, we as energy cooperatives, we can't, uh, we can't leave these people behind. So we have more and more of our members uh, that are setting up uh, uh, things to help people consume less and, and give them advice. What's interesting is that we see that the consumption of electricity of our members, uh, the members of, uh, who are suppliers, year, now, year, year after year, uh, the consumption goes down. In my own cooperative, the average consumption of our of our households is 1600 kilowatt hours. The average consumption of the Flemish consumer is double, is 3200. Uh, part of it is due to the fact that they have been installing solar panels, huh? but 44% of them have been installing solar panels, but also the people without solar panels, they consume significantly less than the average Flemish households. So this is something which has been examined in a European project. You can find it on our website. Um, so uh, members provide, uh, this is an example of, of some energia. Uh, so where through, through uh, information, they, uh, they bring people to buying efficient uh, uh, the freezers, uh, uh, refrigerators. Uh. So for instance, in my own house, I discovered that the, the deep freezer who uh, was given to me when, uh, when uh, my wife and I, when we married, uh, uh, we thought we had a good deep freezer, but it was one third of our consumption. So we got rid of the deep freezer. And, uh, and so we consume less than uh, one third less. And so. So um, yeah, so we advise our members to consume less. So um, what's also interesting and what was new for the commission is that uh, we have quite a lot of members who are owner of the, the grid. Um, most of them, of these uh, cooperatives are in mountainous areas. Uh, most of the time they also have production mainly by hydropower. So you can find them, for instance, um, in the north of Italy. Don't go there for the moment, it's very dangerous. But uh, in South Tyrol, the German speaking part of Italy, um, there are about uh, 80 of these uh, energy cooperatives and most of them are uh, more or, or around 100 years old, uh, about a century old. So they were created by the, the local people uh, after, the second, after the First World War. Uh, and um, they started with a hydropower plant and they started distributing the electricity and they still do. And when you go there, it's, uh, the, <laughs> you might notice that they have, they have smart grids, smart meters, they integrated solar panels, renewables. Uh, and how come all the, they are, all, all 80 of them are very small, Well, they work very well together. Yeah. This is an example how you can cooperate and be very, uh, very uh, progressive, very advanced. So most of the time in, in our economy, we think, well, you have the economy of scale. We, we have to, in, in Flanders now, all the suppliers, all the um, distribution system operators, they merge, we only have one. And they think that by being big, they, they are very efficient. Well, the example of South Tyrol shows that there is another way as well. You can be very efficient by working very well together. Uh, but there is also a tendency, um, especially in Germany, uh, where uh, local people want to buy or take control over the local grid, where, is, where this was ceded to over the past uh, 
yeah, let's say fifth, four, since the Second World War, where this was taken over by big utilities. Uh, and so it's uh, called remunicipalization re uh, of, uh, of the grid. Uh, it has been going on in Hamburg, uh, to, to give you a big example, but also in Berlin, this will probably succeed. But it all started in a small, uh, in a small village called Schönau, uh, where uh, they are called Stromrebellen, uh, the, the rebels of, of the energy rebels. And um, so this is a sort of tendency which, uh, when we, uh, when the European Commission introduced uh, the new directives, uh, uh, this was uh, caused a lot of fear also in France that uh, everything will be cut up again in small grids and so on. But yeah, so in Germany there is there is this tendency, but they have also the history. Yeah, so. Uh, before the Second World War, there were about 6,000 energy cooperatives who mainly owned the grid. Huh? So about 40 of them survived uh, capitalism, communism, and yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, what we also see now is that, um, um, and this is also, reflected in the new directives of Europe is that there is a sort of um, people like in their neighborhood to organize themselves. It is also considered that this might be a, a solution for finding uh, balancing at a local level instead of at a higher level, or it might be more complicated. And so uh, some of our members have been engaged in, in test sites, uh, like here in the city of Ghent, uh, Buurzaam Stroom. Buur means neighbor. Huh? Uh, Buurzaam, it, you know, it is a, it's, a, it's in Dutch, it's a pun. Huh? Duurzaam is sustainable and Buurzaam resembles, but it's with neighbors, huh? sustainable with sustainable energy with neighbors, you could <laughs> translate it, it's difficult to translate. So, but there we, uh, we were also involved in uh, my cooperative, EcoPower, um, with a lot of partners in the city, in the university, the local cooperative, the distribution system operator. So the aim was to maximize the production of uh, photovoltaic in, uh, panels on suitable roofs, um, not only where people owned the roof, but were also where they rented. It was a neighborhood with a lot of uh, people with a migrant background from Turkey or uh, from people all over the, the world, not speaking the language very well. So if, if we succeeded in this neighborhood, it would succeed everywhere, we thought. Um, we also discovered there uh, that there are still a lot of uh, obstacles. Uh, we wanted to install a neighborhood battery, a small district heating system. So it was uh, an interesting project. We, we learned a lot and we might repeat these things uh, if we are allowed to do so in the future all over Europe. So these are, um, so, these tryouts, these tests, we, we can do them thanks to European projects, uh, Horizon 2020 projects or Interact projects. And on our website, you can find references to all these projects and you can go into, you will find, you will lose yourself in all the information we provide. Um, so um, Flexcope, Widescreen, see Community Virtual Power Plant. Uh, uh, compile and rescue virtual power plant. That's a very new one that's starting now. Yeah. What's also um, coming more and more is that our members, they um, diversify. Uh, they start normally with renewable energy production but we see now more and more that, uh, and also my own cooperative, we, we have the first initiatives of uh, engaging ourselves in district heating. Uh, so uh, energy cooperatives, they uh, 
operate uh, 16 operators. So. Um, Denmark is the example. Uh, I think more than 90% of the district heating uh, companies in Denmark are cooperatives. Um, one of our board members is, uh, works for an engineering company that services these uh, citizen initiatives. Uh, and they are very performant, very, very, uh, very professional. Uh, in, so in Denmark, there are about 300 of these uh, district heating cooperatives. And so uh, we know also pe people in the Netherlands where they, their gas is uh, their natural, uh, yeah, it's fossil gas, of course, their gas is uh, running out and they, they will switch now to renewables instead of, and, and district heating instead of buying gas from, from Russia. So in the Netherlands, a lot of energy cooperatives are uh, looking into uh, district heating as a solution. New is also that we, um, that more and more energy cooperatives engage in electrical vehicle sharing. It's not only cars, but also, also other uh, electrical vehicles, uh, but mainly cars. Um, and we, as a federation, we saw this coming up. And we brought them together and we created a, a European cooperative society of cooperatives. Uh, well, because we saw all of them struggling to set up an app and making the same mistakes. And now these, uh, they become a member of the Mobility Factory. That's the name of the European cooperative. They uh, co-develop the app and they co-own co it they can use it. And they can immediately start by becoming a member and the ultimate result will, it's already the case that with your app from your electrical car sharing cooperative in Belgium, you, you go to Spain, you can, uh, you can uh, reserve a car there uh, from our other member in Girona, for instance, in, in Spain, Catalonia. So that's, um, yeah, they have a hard time now because people don't drive cars in the corona. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, um, just to, to stress it, so energy cooperatives are uh, rather a, a social concept than a commercial concept. So it's, uh, cooperatives are always a, a response to a problem. Uh, for a lot of our members, this, the early ones, it was the problem of the oil crisis huh? in 1973. I was 14 then. Uh, and some of our oldest members were created. It could, or in South Tyrol after the First World War, it was the fact that the Italians didn't want to bring electricity to the German-speaking villages in, in South Tyrol. So the people had to do it themselves. Often this was the case in rural areas where it, there was no profit to be made. So people had to do it themselves. Either it, the municipalities did it, so it was public or the people did it and then it was in cooperatives. So now the problem is climate change, but also a, um, more and more the driver is uh, the return to the local economy. Yeah? So uh, people, if you see the amounts of money leaving our country, our village, for buying gas, oil, coal, uranium, whatever, uh, if you turn to renewables, this money stays in your, uh, perhaps not in your own pocket, but in, in the local area, and it accumulates. Uh, and at the you time, this makes a big difference. Huh? So, so cooperatives are, in fact, a, a, an answer to a problem, a solution to a problem. And sometimes they join forces and they do incredible things. And so this very large, nearly offshore wind farm in the Netherlands, and the water goes up a meter, one meter, it's offshore, I think. Um, they uh, invested 240 million euro together, two cooperatives with 5,000 members. 
uh, for the biggest wind farm owned by citizens in the Netherlands. And so it was, it started last year, the production. I'm a member, just to get to know how they work. It's in the Netherlands, it's completely different than in Belgium, but I'm a member. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> we also are joining forces now at the European level to help finance uh, the projects of starting cooperatives or strongly growing cooperatives. So we, we uh, noticed that um, um, there's a problem. Citizens, they are willing to invest in renewables, but they come with their money when actually when it's too late. So they come when the wind turbine is up and running, but then everything has, to, has already been paid for, for months or years even. Yeah? So uh, to overcome this, this problem, uh, we created a European cooperative, a, a mutual we call it, it's, it's a European cooperative society. Uh, it's still uh, in its first, uh, I was, we're still in this, as, as starting up. But uh, for instance, what we could do with this vehicle, uh, so there are developers that, even wind turbine manufacturers, that develop a wind farm, they uh, exploit it for a year or three so they can show good figures, and then they sell. Often these wind farms are, so, as, are bought by pension funds or by uh, investment uh, vehicles or by Chinese state company. Uh, or something uh, and we would like to do we would like to compete with them and and buy these wind farms in rural areas so we can offer them to the local citizens so that they can take them over and so that the profits stay local and so that's the aim of Rescop Misais that's the fund we created yeah so um, we see that our best practices, so the, our members who, who uh, are really an example, uh, in, in most cases, they have a, an excellent collaboration with the local authority, with the, the city, the municipality. Sometimes the cooperative is the result of an initiative of politicians or is the other way around. Huh? It's an initiative of citizens and after a few years they, they also provide the mayor. Huh? So this happens as well. But uh, we noticed that in Europe there are a few uh, networks of cities and, and municipalities that are quite progressive when it comes to climate, uh, to climate uh, change uh, actions and uh, energy transition. Um, they are called energy cities or a climate alliance or ICLE. So there are three or four, there's, there's, there's certainly four networks, I think. They also um, work together with the European Commission in the Covenant of Mayors. In the Covenant of Mayors, uh, the mayors, they, they commit themselves and their municipality or their city to to, um, to, uh, to to reduce uh, CO2 emissions, to, to speed up with renewables and, and um, being more energy efficient. So this is a, actually a sort of covenant between Europe and the, very lo and the lowest uh, authority level, which is unique, I think. And um, there these networks play, uh, they, they are, they, they do the secretariat for this covenant of mayors. So we, we are on the local level, actually we work very well together with the local authorities. And we think this might be the way to grow the movement in Eastern Europe, uh, where, um, where more and more municipalities also join the covenant of mayors and where we uh, can uh, offer them a collaboration so that they engage their citizens uh, to invest 
together with the municipality in the energy transition. So on our website, you can find a, a, uh, a document uh, uh, about this as well, with examples. So, uh, yeah, I once again give the example of, uh, of one of these examples is the city of Ghent. The, the vice mayor of Ghent is the vice president of one of these networks of cities of Climate Alliance. Uh, so there's a local uh, cooperative in Ghent that together with EcoPower and was engaged in this project I told you about, Buza Armstrong. In the city of Halle, just south of Brussels, I, that's where I was born. The city, together with the local cooperative Biopower, they, uh, the, the cooperative invested in changing public lighting to LED and people could adopt one of the lights. Uh, so it's not a very big project. And then my own cooperative, we have a very good collaboration since 1999 with the city of Eklo. Uh, we've been building wind turbines, solar panels, uh, cogeneration, uh, and now we are working on district heating uh, with the city and also the local cooperative. Uh, in the city of Leuven, just uh, upstream of our water mill here, um, Ecopower was chosen to be the strategic partner in the energy transition for the city. And we uh, have been mobilizing the citizens in what which is called Licht Leuven. Uh, it's an approach to create energy communities. So we don't we not only have to mobilize the money of the citizens to finance the energy transition, but we also want to claim some of their time because they we need people to help politicians to uh, to reach the, the goals they uh, signed up for in the covenant of mayors. So uh, another example of collaboration uh, between uh, cooperatives and and, uh, and uh, energy cooperatives is in the German part of Belgium. I, I chose the, the, the examples I know best where um, Courant Air, which is the local energy cooperative with, I think, 1,200 members. They teamed up with my cooperative because we, we have the financial stability to convince municipalities that we are, uh, that we are, um, that when they choose us in a tender, that, that they uh, can be sure that the project will be uh, realized. So these two um, small municipalities, but uh, with a lot of territory, and mainly farmers, um, low budget to be spent uh, by the municipality. But they had these two uh, municipalities had a place for five to six wind turbines, and they organized a public tender. And in this tender, they uh, said, "Well, we, when you offer us as a municipality or and or our citizens uh, participation." Uh, you will get better uh, marks. And in this standard, finally, uh, the two cooperatives were chosen over all the big developers like NG, Electrabel, uh, EDF, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, and we're now waiting for the permit. There are always problems with permits, but <laughs> okay, but we hope to build these wind turbines together with the municipalities. So what's the big, um, big uh, change? Yeah? So the energy transition, um, I guess you're young, you all know, we are going from centralized to decentralized, from fossil and nuclear to renewable. And um, so citizens become an active player in the energy transition. And um, we have uh, studied, I, well, CE Delft uh, studied this. Uh, what's the potential of what citizens can do uh, by 2050? And um, we think that of almost half of the electricity we need then, uh, this is only one slide, uh, only half, almost half of the electricity we need in 2050. And 
we will do a lot more with electricity by then. Uh, think of, uh, of heat pumps uh, for heating, uh, for cooling, but also mobility. Uh, we will have we'll, we'll have switched completely to, to electricity for mobility. Uh, but almost half can be produced by citizens either by themselves individually on their on their roofs or together with other in uh, cooperatives or energy communities as they are called now as well and then we come uh, yeah the to the clean energy package uh, so at the end of 2016 uh, the european commission came up with a complete revision of all the directives on energy uh, it was a total of 4000 pages and um, preceding this this publication in i think it was november 2016 uh, they had been um, talking to all stakeholders in the energy uh, market so they they talked to us to the energy cooperatives and um what they asked us what what is hindering you what is bothering you what 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 annoys you what is uh what would you like to change yeah. and so um, one of the main things we wanted is that what our members do so what the existing energy cooperatives do what citizens are able to do through these energy cooperatives that this was recognized that our that the fact that we we are cooperatives and not actually not for profit uh, that we that we got a definition and of course uh, in the first drafts they wrote well energy cooperatives but uh, we told them well actually quite a lot of the members are not cooperatives they're they're not for profit organizations they're trusts they're ngos so um so they came up with and also the word cooperative in the former communist countries is corrupted by communism so it's for people there if you cooperate it's almost the same as, as a communist so uh, so then we came up with a new uh, terminology new definition so in the energy directive energy market directive where it's about uh, in the electricity market directive where it's about electricity it is called citizen energy community and in the renewable energy directive it's called renewable energy community so to the left citizen energy community this is about electricity and not only renewable here it is about renewable energy it might also be district heating and green green heat and so on so there are two definitions it's a bit strange but you must also, and there are differences. Uh, you see, it's similar, but there are differences, which is confusing. We know we would have liked that these differences were not there, but if you see the initial text, there was there were a lot of more, <laughs> a lot more differences. How come? Well, it was different people working on this definition and on this definition. Not only in the commission. European Commission, but also in the European Parliament and also in the European Council. So our main advocacy work has been in this whole process of getting new directives is trying to make it consistent. And let's say that for 95% we succeeded. And if you look closely at the, at the, uh, at the definitions and you go back in slides to the cooperative principles you will notice that we tried and that we succeeded in putting in most of the cooperative principles into the definitions and especially if you go to the recitals which is the the uh, explanation accompanying uh, explaining how how the text came to to what they are you will you will see more references to the cooperative principles there so we are very happy that we got these definitions from Europe, 
but it's now up to the member states and that process is the transposition of the European directives is now ongoing. They still have a few months, almost a year, um, and we are worried. Uh, uh, we, as a federation, we only have members in 13 member states. We're worried about the countries where we don't have members because there we have less, let's say, let's say lobbying power. But even in the countries, like even my own country, where we have a strong cooperative, there, there are forces uh, to, to change these, well, let's say Europe, the, the directives leave a lot of interpretation margin for the member states. Otherwise, they never come to a directive. So the, the, the transposition, the result in every member state will be quite different when you are from one member state to the other. And we can't, this is, we can't exclude this. Um, I will give you one example. It's an example I, 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 I tell most of the times. The former definitions, uh, they ended the monopolies, uh, the old uh, uh, directives. So they wanted to prevent that one company could have nuclear power plants, high tension grid, mid tension grid, low tension grid, and be the supplier of everyone. So Europe liberalized the energy market. And so you were not allowed to, uh, to do everything. Yeah? So monopolies, it, well, it was called un unbundling. And uh, some countries did this very strictly, in a strict way, like Denmark. So you were only allowed to have one role. Of course, these monopolies, they disassembled and they were sister companies. So, but in Belgium, you could be a producer of renewable energy like EcoPower, like my cooperative, and supply our members with the electricity, and you paid for using the high tension grid, mid tension grid, low tension grid. When our Danish members, when they heard that we were doing this in Belgium, they said, no, 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 that's not allowed by Brussels. Then we said, well, did you ever read the directives? No, no, they didn't read the directives. So when they read directives and they saw that it was in fact their own government, Copenhagen, who prevented them from doing the same as us, they were very angry. So often in member states, they blame Brussels, but actually Brussels is not only the commission and the European parliament, but it's also the council where all member states sit together and they have to become, they have to, to, to agree unanimously most of the time. So often Brussels is blamed, but actually you should blame your own country because they transpose the directive in one way you won't like uh, or another. So what's important? So now citizens are in the center of the energy transition for Europe. And that's important because it's for the first time they refer to us not as consumers, as, a, as citizens, eh? as they should in a democracy. Eh? In a democracy, it's not consumers who vote, but it's citizens who vote. So, so citizens have now rights to produce, consume, uh, to, to sell. Uh, they, have, they have to get a good price for it, eh? a reasonable price. They, they have the right to store electricity. So in my own country, this doesn't change much. But let's say in countries like Eastern Europe, they don't know what, what you're talking about. So even in Spain, in the, until the last the government uh, now, you could put solar panels on your roof, but you couldn't consume it. You had first to put it on the grid and then buy it back at full price. So there, there's something changed, huh? but now it has to be transposed. Huh? And so it's essential that in every country, uh, there's, there's pressure from, from, from citizens, from municipalities, so that everyone can uh, do what we have been able to do in Northwestern Europe. Yeah, that was my last slide. So I, I hope you have a lot of questions. I've been talking almost for an hour. I'm going to drink.
Thank you very much, dear, for wrapping up all the questions uh, concerning um, cooperatives. Um, I want to leave the floor to the students if they have questions. Um, I guess a few of you should have questions at least. Yeah, Fabio. Um, dear, do you mind if I just uh, stop sharing your screen so that we can see all, all the I students? Can, I, can, I can stop sharing. Yeah, it. okay, great, thank you. So, um, Fabio, you raise your hand. I, I, Axel, Eman. So, uh, is it okay if you take uh, three questions first and answer them, and then we take a second round of questions? I might forget the question, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> or we can go question by question. Yeah, it's up to you. That's easier for me. Otherwise, okay. So then, Fabio, shoot on. Yes, I had a couple of questions actually. So I was, okay, so actually you will have a round of questions in the end. <laughs> I'll, I'll take my, my, my pen, yeah. Yeah, since you've mentioned that advocacy, if you prefer, other than lobbying, is one of your main activities. I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a bit more on that, since you explained as how it was important for you, the terminology. I was wondering which were your other priorities and which main challenges you face in your uh, advocacy activities. And then my second question would be about the fact that since a lot of states now have changed from the feeding tariffs to the auction systems, and you said you've mentioned you are in Belgium, you've managed to win one auction within the wind sector against the big uh, other companies. I was wondering if this would be one of your options, if you are considering to compete with them or you have uh, other or you have elaborated other schemes that you, you would like the EU to implement or if you have a backup plan. Thank you. Yeah, so about the advocacy. Uh, uh, what are the challenges? The challenges is that we, um, uh, that we don't have a lot of capacity. Huh? So uh, let's say that now for our federation, we have one person full time on advocacy, um, and I think the big utilities they have together maybe a few thousand people in Brussels. Um, I once was an event and and I, I told them, well, we we only have one, and there are thousand others. There was there was a cartoonist who made the sort of cartoon uh, report of the meeting and he made a cartoon I, I can't show you the, I, I have it somewhere but he made a cartoon of, of, of me with a sword uh, uh, and and then there was a there was a, a whole cohort so a whole legion of identical persons with a tie and I don't wear ties so and and they all had a, an attache case and so so and, uh, that was the, the, the picture you had. So, and, and I have a text below and I say, but we are ethical. And that's the strength of, of what we do. We are not there for profit. We are there for the well-being of society, of, 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 our, of our environment. And who is against us is a bad person. Yeah, so if he's there for profit, and he fights us. And we've encountered a lot of, uh, it was like, ah, finally you're there. And when we went to the European Commission, eh? so we found a lot of people very sympathetic to our cause, even on the highest level, commissioners, uh, like Caniete, who comes out of, from Spain, who comes out of the oil sector. But he was very sympathetic to our calls, high, high officials. And we then discovered that they, in their own country, they were a member of a cooperative and so on. So we, although we are very small, I, we only have one person, we found a lot of, uh, of support in the commission, in, in, the, uh, in the parliament, from all almost all fractions. So cooperative, the cooperative idea is not something from the left side of the political scene or the right side. It's it's something which is in every person, in every human being. And so, 
yeah, but nevertheless, we have challenges. Huh? We, we had a lot of difficulties in explaining the concept of an energy community, especially to those uh, representatives of countries where, where there's only a state or a private monopoly. Uh, like France, it was very difficult to talk to people from France. Uh, and uh, we were, there was a reproach that we were uh, free riders, rich people wanting to disconnect from the grid because we have the, the financial means and things like that. So, so we had a lot of work in, in getting through our, our message and the concept. And I think we, we succeeded. Yeah, then the about the, the switch from feeding tariffs, which was very comfortable, for instance, for our members in Germany, they are very sad, they, 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 they will have to compete in, in, in auctions. Just to be very clear, the auction system in Germany is to get the, the support. When I talk about auctions in Belgium, it's to get the piece of land to put a wind turbine on or a solar panel on. So that's a different type of auction. Yeah? So in, in, in Belgium, we don't have to auction. Uh, the, there's no auction for the support. Yeah? It's only for the right to build a wind turbine somewhere on a piece of land. Um, what we have been advocating for, lobbying for, with the feeding with the, the new uh, clean energy package, is that since we are a separate player, we which is not for profit. Yeah? And since we are small, most of us are small, often with, we work with volunteers, we said we, the, the image we, we gave them is we are cyclists, we are bikers, and we want a bike lane. Don't force us to, to among the, the, the trucks on a, on a highway. Yeah? And uh, so, yes, if you introduce tenders, well, why don't you organize a tender for community energy? Uh, uh, why don't you have a sub-target for community energy in your targets? And the example we refer to, where there's a, quite a years of experience is Scotland. Uh, so in Scotland, there is not only a sub-target for community energy. So there's a renewable energy target, but there's a sub-target. A piece of the pie is reserved for community energy. Uh, and this was substantial. Yeah? But there's also financial, technical, uh, legal support for communities to set up their, their projects. And it's in the, the financial part is in a way that when the project succeeds, it was a loan with an interest when it fails because of birds and bats and bees and whatever, yeah, people, then it was a, a grant, it was a gift. So, so in Scotland, they took away the risk for the, for the local people and this was a success. And it seems now that Ireland, you know, there, there's a special uh, tender now for community energy. It's only 1%, but it is something. Yeah? And actually, we don't want 1%, we want 50%. <laughs> yeah. Um, Eman, I, should, I saw your hand uh, a while ago. Is it still OK? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, but I have three or four questions. I answer two of them. So I will ask just one. So first, I want to thank you for your presentation. And as I mentioned, I'm writing my thesis on energy justice and empowering communities by creating energy cooperatives. So, because I'm very convinced, convinced by the philosophy behind it and what they offer to communities. So, I want to ask you on which condition energy cooperatives can be a driver of development and empowerment and not just uh, an energy source or an energy provider for the community. Didn't really get the whole question. On which condition? Uh, on which conditions energy cooperatives can be a driver of development for development in communities like uh, agriculture cooperatives were in the last century. Mm. And now we have farmers or poor people. 
So the the um, the story we tell to local authorities, to mayors and, and, and members of the council, um, let's say 15 years ago, it used to be uh, we have to do this for the climate and for the environment. And we were not able to convince all councillors. Now we, we uh, it, it, it might sound a bit strange, but we only talk about money. Yeah, and about the money staying in the local economy and not leaving because we are using all these fossil fuels or even uranium. Uranium doesn't come from Belgium. It doesn't come from Belgium. You know where it comes from? Yeah, Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria. Uh, you know, it's okay. Or Russia, yeah, which is even. <laughs> so, and. Um, and this, they all understand. Uh, personally, I've, I've been able to, in, in Holland, for instance, in the council, there were, uh, I think, 13 different political parties. Yeah, so in, in Holland, the, the political scene is, is splintered. Yeah? The biggest party has 13% of the votes, huh? so give you an idea. And I was, I was able to convince them all when showing them how much money would stay in the local economy. And now there are more and more scientific studies that are, it depends on the country. Eh? In, in France, the return is three times higher when the wind turbines are owned by the local people than when they are owned by someone else from outside the community. In Germany, it's eight times more. It, that's because the electricity is cheap in France, I suppose. And expensive in Germany. So, and once local politicians and also the local citizens, when they say, in Belgium, it's 2,000 euro per year per household that leaves the country. Okay. So, if you, if, if they realize, yeah, and they say, well, in our municipality, it's 10,000 households, that's 20 million euro. Yeah. And then, when they see and every year, huh? so, and I think uh, I just wrote a, an article in Euractive, uh, it, it was published today. We really think that the energy transition, when the production facilities are owned, when the wind turbines in France in the rural areas are owned by the local people, it is a key to a new, to finding a new balance between the globalizing economy and the survival of the local economy. And the energy transition is the key, but only if the ownership is right. And we are convincing more and more local municipalities. In Holland, our members succeeded in getting this into the climate agreement it's a, it's, there is a, it's an aim, it's not an obligation, but when it comes to the implementation on, on the local, uh, on the local level, it's the municipalities that make an obligation of this 50%. So we're not greedy. Yeah? We ne also need the big investors. Yeah? We, there's, there's work enough to be done, but we want 50% of the renewables in citizens' hands. And why are, why are we not greedy? Well, when you look at who uh, ensures the profits for the people who invest or the companies who invest in renewables, right? so the support mechanism, the support always comes from the small consumers. In Belgium, 90% of the cost of the energy transition is reflected in the tariffs of the low tension customers, which are mainly citizens and very small entrepreneurs, and very small uh, companies, uh, local butcher, uh, the local uh, baker and so on. So if we are able to, to, uh, to cover, like to ensure 90% of the cost, uh, why can't we own 50%? So we're not greedy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
Uh, maybe just to, to, pick up, to pick up on the question of uh, Eamon, how do you uh, motivate citizens to be part of this movement? I mean, uh, what are the drivers or what, what do you tell them to convince them? Because you said uh, you convince the councillors, you convince the local authorities, but um, I mean, how do you do with the citizens themselves? Sorry, I'm uh, sorry for the question. I'll give you the floor. Uh, it's... Um, every year, our German, uh, the German Federation, DGRV, they, uh, they question their members and also the motivation why people uh, uh, become a member of an energy cooperative. And of course, one of the motivators is that I have a return on my money that is higher than than my savings account. But that's not difficult to give, to have more than a savings account. Right? And so it's nothing. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but the main driver, uh, and you find this, uh, there's an English version on their website of EGRV. Yeah? Uh, there's a, an English version, uh, and you can find it there in their website. Um, the main driver is, I want to do something for the local economy, for my community. And also in the UK, this is the driver. Eh? So yeah, you have some return, but most of the profits go to the local community and, and the people decide how to spend it. Eh? So we see some of our members building a kindergarten for the municipality, or they renovate it's the same example. They renovate a, 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 an old brewery, and there's a there's a, a festivity hall now, and there's a kindergarten. And so sometimes we see cooperatives that were uh, in, in the Netherlands. There's one example in this village, uh, one of the villages around the city, and the city is the is now the municipality. So the last shop closed, right, it was the pub. And that was too much for the people. So they, they, they came together and they bought the pub together. And they renovated it, they added a museum. And then they said, well, what's, what, what are, for other problems do we have? Well, young people leave our village. And why? Because there's no, there's, there are no small houses. And then they built 24 small houses. And the next thing they did, they started an energy cooperative. And now they've been installing fiberglass network because they didn't have it. So people get empowered and they, and I told them once I was there and they, they had been telling me, and I said, you know what you're doing? You're recreating your municipality. Because a municipality is in fact the ultimate cooperative. But people don't recognize it anymore because there's a distance between the distance between the politicians and, and, and the citizens is, has become too big when a municipality becomes too big. So uh, it is an answer. So how do we, we, we uh, convince them? Yeah, there is something, it's a mixture about something for myself, but also for the community. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Axel, maybe first and Alex then. Yes, um, I have a question on energy poverty. Um, how you mentioned it's still work in progress for you guys. How is it? How are you trying to tackle it? Is it just energy efficiency, or have you made links with other aspects? With, for instance, mobility, because you did mention car sharing. Is that something that could work to tackle energy poverty? In, in your opinion. So what is, um, yes, I think we as energy community and energy cooperatives, we could help tackle the problems that people have with uh, low income. And this has uh, an effect not only on their ability to, to buy electricity and gas and whatever, 
could also on their mobility. So they buy sheep old cars that pollute and they are not allowed to drive to the city center anymore and they can't go to the shop and the hospital. So, and then you have yellow jackets in, in, in yep. France. Uh, yes, and we think that, as I said, if the energy transition is owned by these local people in these local villages in France that are far away from the doctor and the hospital and the, and the supermarket, they will have the financial means to set up also car sharing and go with an electrical car to the supermarket. But not, it will not be owned by themselves, but it would be shared. Um, we see that the electrical car sharing has more and more success. We, see, we also have members um, that where volunteers bring elderly people to the hospital. So with the car sharing uh, cooperatives. Yeah? So, um, uh, also in the UK, uh, where where public transport was privatized, so that this meant that buses with not enough passengers, they were these lines were uh, were uh, given up. So there we see cooperatives taking over with volunteers, with elderly people, uh, with pension people. Uh, yeah. So when there's a problem, people try to find the solution. Huh? Uh, my own cooperative, EcoPower, uh, in the city of Eklo, our last winter buying there, the city um, bought 25% of the shares representing one quarter of the winter buying. And they will use these shares to, um, the, to, to allow people who have a budget meter, so people who have problems buying their electricity or gas, and all gas. Um, so th these, these shares will be used so they can switch immediately to the tariff of EcoPower, which is lower than the tariff of budget meter. This seems a bit strange, but in Flanders, people who have a budget meter, they have the highest electricity price. Uh, how come? Well, this is the neoliberal thinking so if it's it's expensive, people will go to the free market, but they, people, they, these people don't have this mobility. So the city now will offer them a share. They won't own it, but it will allow them to switch immediately to eco power. And the difference will be, the price will almost be the cost of one share a year. And so, so that's how we as eco power try to do something. There are other examples. Uh, it's also, um, yeah, helping people uh, insulate their homes and so on. Yeah, but it's a, not an easy, an easy. Uh, we also uh, um, see that, uh, like for my own cooperative, two hundred fifty euro for people in who are don't have a lot of financial income. That's a lot of money. So we allow them to save. The, the share. So with every every invoice uh, every month, they save five euros, for instance. And, but they they already have the uh, they can have the electricity of Eco Power already. So so let's say it's a concern we have. Uh, so we can't solve everything, but together with cities and municipalities, we we can do things. Is that an answer? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, coming from the US, I, it's a couple of the things you mentioned um, brought some questions to mind. So um, my question is, you spoke about um, sometimes in some countries, cooperatives being associated with communism. Mm -hmm. um, and you also, at one point, you mentioned, you tell, but you mentioned um, Energia in Catalonia, I was wondering um, what, how do you navigate troubles or what are your strategic, um, what's your strategic advice for addressing issues when lobbyism is um, sometimes portrayed in a negative light or cooperatives in, in the US where I'm from? Um, the term lobby can sometimes come with some very negative um, 
uh, opinions and also um, in terms of uh, favoritism. I don't know so much about the situation with energy in, in Spain, but um, what, what are your, your strategies for working with uh, communities that are sometimes not as well represented, represented in their, their country? Thank you. Mm. <laughs> oh, that's a difficult question. Um, where can I start? Yeah. So, of course, I, among, among people who start with energy cooperatives in Europe, often they are come from, let's say, the green movement, often. But we, um, if we want to, to uh, if we want the energy to transition to succeed, uh, we must reach most of the people. Uh, so um, that's why we, we in our uh, we, we are and, and we succeed in. Uh, so we, we we are working together with the, the farmers' organization. Farmers are most of the time quite conservative. Um, and also in Germany, we see that in energy cooperatives, you can have Greenpeace, milit militant people, and, and sitting next to a, a, a conservative uh, farmer from Bayern in this Lederhosen. Huh? Uh, so we, we are with what we do and with the concern for the community as a whole, we, we can reach everyone, regardless of their, whether they're progressive or conservative. And what has gone wrong in, 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 uh, in Eastern Europe, but also in, in countries like Greece, is that uh, the ruling party, either it was Communist Party or in, in Greece it was either the Socialists or the Conservatives, they put them, themselves on top and they, they started uh, directing how they work, the cooperatives. So and as I explained, this, this is against the cooperative principles. So, um, so we have to, we have to be careful. Uh, and also that for me, it's sometimes very difficult because I'm also one of the founders of the Green Party in Flanders. We have to be careful that I don't use the political jargon I'm familiar with. Yeah? Uh, so uh, that's an exercise uh, and for me and for many of our uh, collaborators. But that's why we focus on the return to the community as a whole. Yeah? And so the cooperative ID is not linked to left or right or center. It's it's I often say it every person and I now uh, found us we are a country of, of cartoons uh, and strip strip books. You know, how do you call it? Cartoons, yeah. Uh, you know uh, Tintin, uh, Tintin <laughs> and uh, and <laughs> we have many. So in one of them uh, there is uh, uh, on your left shoulder there's a little angel. And on your right shoulder, there's a little devil. Well, you don't see the devil, but there's a devil. And they were both whispering things in your ear. Huh? And everyone, every person has these both sides. And here's a little cooperative. Huh? It's us, social, uh, together, work, working with other. And it's more, a little bit more female than the other one. And here's the little devil. That's me, myself, and I. Huh? And, uh, and Everyone has these both aspects, uh, and you have to starve this one and feed the other one. Huh? So, and 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 I, 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 what we really think is that we must stop with this capitalist economy, and we there must come a new a new uh, millennium of a cooperative economy. Huh? And. Uh, in the in the text I wrote today, I, I was published today. I said, "Well, in times of crisis, most people go into uh, some some begin to, to to run to the shop and buy all the toilet paper available." <laughs> but 
but I, I don't see why you can't eat toilet paper, I think. But uh, in times of crisis, most people go into a cooperative mode. Yeah? People start, solidarity comes to the surface and it's people help each other. They, they, they sympathize with the doctors and the, and, the, and the people, the nurses who are not well paid and, and so on. And then this comes to surface. Uh, there's one spin, uh, and I, I don't find it. Once uh, there was a study in Belgium, when were people, the, what was the happiest period in the last century in Belgium? And what was very astonishing, it was during World War II. And why? Because people helped each other. People were showed solidarity. There was community building, and we we don't have to depend on crisis to to I, we we have to stay in the cooperative mode. We have to go back into the cooperative mode all the time, and that's frightening for some people. And I'm allowed. I'm even invited by the European Commission to tell this in Brussels, and that the building doesn't crumble. But, but time of, of capitalism is, is over. Huh? Yeah, we've seen it in Belgium now, there are no masks. Why? Well, yeah, everything's just in time. Huh? You just order them. There's a, there's a plane coming from China and the day, two days later, we have masks. Huh? But then when there's a crisis, the, the planes don't come. Huh? Then we have a problem. Huh? So we have to have a strategic reserve. Yeah, and we have to we have to pay serious wages for the nurses and yeah, so well <laughs> that's that's my opinion. Um, Eman, do you want to add something or ask something more? No, I just want to thank him because this is the spirit of my thesis and what I'm trying to write and to do and it's Perfect. It's giving me hope to write it. So you. maybe to maybe to to help you even more with your thesis, may I ask you, Dirk, how would you would define empowerment through cooperatives, for example, and how would you define this new concept of inclusive energy communities, which are both <laughs> linked, I guess, to the same kind of issues. But I would be interested to to know how you would define them. Yeah, definitions, yeah. <laughs> or how you would conceptualize them, whatever. <laughs> well, I've, I've seen it happen everywhere. If, if um, So this energy transition, because uh, the production of electricity, uh, as long as it was something far away, in a big nuclear power station, huh? so people couldn't grasp they they could play a role in 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 this whole thing, like in France huh, with seventy percent more than seventy percent of nuclear power. Uh, most people they they don't have any clue why they should and why they how they could play a role, but now with these solar panels becoming so cheap and and soon. The, the batteries are, are cheap enough to, to have them at home and, and we will play a, like our study of C.E. Delft shows, we, we will play a crucial role as citizens in the, in the energy sector. And, and the big companies, they know, huh? so the former monopolist in Belgium now, they, they advertise and they have the money for to do it. They advertise, you don't have solar panels yet. No problem. We will put them on your roof, and when they're dirty, we come and clean them, and we will we will add a battery when it's suitable. And so they they won't sell kilowatt hours anymore. They they will sell you light in your house, and your house will be warm or cool, and they will service you. Yeah? And you can't this service can't be measured by kilowatt hours, by a meter, it will be a package. Eh? So they will try to prevent us citizens take control. And they will try to do this by servicing people. Eh? So 
people who are yeah so what's empowerment is when people realize that together they can take up this role it will bring it will leave let's say it will leave money in the local economy that so that money they can use to make life in their community better worthwhile they will have money to invest to have money to build houses for young people they will have money to install the uh, glass fiber network where the, the the big companies are not interested because there's no money to be made so that's according to me that's of course you need education and that's also one of the principles of cooperatives you have to educate people inform them if you would see how much how much uh, effort we do as a cooperative to reach out to our 60,000 members most of them are lazy <laughs> we should we, we want them to become more active and so we uh, in this province uh, we created 10 energy communities and it's, it's we're, we're lazy members eh? so we because our politicians uh, they they don't have a clue how they will reach the targets eh? so they need a group of of people in every municipality we need a group of people backing the politicians to help them reach the goals eh? they must look for suitable rules or solar panels they must look for uh, the possibilities of, of district heating is there is there a factory that has excess heat and we can use for heating buildings replacing gas but and, and things like that so there's a lot of work eh? in, in it was figured out in belgium the energy transition will cost 400 billion euro in belgium alone 400 billion euro and you will say well that's impossible eh? it's to reach 100 percent renewables eh? But the Belgian citizens have 275 billion euro savings accounts. And every year, 20 million euro goes out of the country for buying oil, gas, coal, uranium. So there's a business model. Huh? So, but of course, we people must realize this and we must convince people. We must at a local level and then finally at the national level, we must just do it. Huh? Yeah, is this an answer? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> it is, um, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, a concluding question, maybe? Alex? Yes, um, I just have a question. If you have some strategies for negotiation um, in terms of lobbying, uh, especially in that, um, sorry to go back from the US, but where I'm coming from right now, uh, the current administration seems to withhold funding for states or regions that um, are political opponents. Right now, some examples in terms of transportation, public transportation, people are denied um, or regionally denied funds, as well as now we have a problem in the state of Michigan where uh, masks for uh, medical staff during coronavirus are not being provided because of a uh, political tensions between a mayor and the administration. So I was just wondering if you have any sort of uh, power or negotiation suggestions. So what we do is we, we, we try to find uh, advocates in, in every site. So we have uh, my own cooperative we have members in all political parties even in, in the very extreme flemish nationalist almost nazist party so and that's what i told you it's not something of left or right i think you i we're into contact with the with the rural electricity co cooperatives of, of the united states they they have uh, they have uh, they're very conserved they come from the rural areas huh? you probably know them yeah? so 70 percent of the of the territory of the united states is the distribution of electricity is owned by energy cooperatives they were created in the in the new deal huh? a period in the 30s i think 1930s and um we've met them 
they were very surprised that we were only into renewables because they're into coal and, and, and nuclear as well. But, but it was very interesting, uh, and we still are in contact. Uh, but what was very surprising is what they do together with USAID money in Latin America and Africa. They are setting up energy cooperatives there, not to control them or exploit them, but just because they want to do this. So there, there is something I, we want to work together with them on this. Um, but they, well, I think most of them voted for Trump. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, we can work together. So I think you have to find, I th I'm sure if it's, a, if it's about energy, you will, uh, you will find people in all political sides that are in favor of it. I also noticed, uh, I, I was in the States last time I was there in 2013. I met Bernie Sanders and we shook hands, by the way. Wow. I spoke at the same, spoke at the same event. As, people came for him, not for me. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I noticed the driver there to invest in renewables for citizens was more like, I want to be independent. It's more expensive. I don't care. I don't want to rely on the grid. We have people like this as well, but here... Uh, the driver to invest uh, so in Flanders, we I think it's even more than in, in Germany. We have more solar panels in Flanders than, than in Germany I, per person. Here, the driver was purely financial. For most people, was financial. It was profitable. But in in the states, the people I met there, that was about independence, about being. Uh, uh, I, I will have electricity when the grid is no longer there. Yeah, so you know, there's a, there's another mentality, but there are also energy cooperatives. Other uh, more like us. Uh, I've had uh, people from from Vermont here in 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 Belgium uh, two years ago. So yeah, but to answer your question, I think you can find supporters in both uh, in in Democrats and Republicans. I'm sure you can. Like uh, Arne Schwarzenegger, he's in favor of energy cooperatives. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's 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 also from California, so he's. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know our, our advocacy officer is from California, huh? Josh Roberts. I'm sorry, your your who officer? Our our advocacy officer of Fresco okay. is from California, Josh Roberts. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to, to pick up on the point made um, uh, by Alex and um, on your answer, uh, do you have as RISCOP.EU cooperation with Africa on the same issue? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, appeal to us from other continents, but we are not able to, uh, we can't cope with this financially. And also uh -huh. the time, we don't have time, but we do participate there is a, a program of the, uh, uh, the DG DEF, the Development uh, uh, Director General, with the cooperative movement of Europe and international cooperative movement, about uh, to attract cooperatives around the world to use European uh, development money, because they noticed cooperatives were not uh, applying for European development money. And this project has been running for a few years now. And uh, I've been to several events at, and they asked me to talk about energy cooperatives. But for, for instance, in Africa, that's, that's the solution. We, when they come to us, we, we, uh, we, you know, they can come and we, we try to help them. But a, a structural support of our European Federation to citizens in Africa, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. But as I said, the Americans, they are doing a great job there, according to us. And we would like to join them to strengthen what they do. So we don't have to, to copy what they do. They, they've been doing this for decades already. And they have a good approach, I, I think, from what I've seen. 
and uh, we we think we might strengthen them. Some of our members they they do bilateral things. There are cooperatives in Germany, for instance, half of their profits they help energy communities, energy cooperatives in Africa or in Asia or in Latin America. So there certainly is an interest of of among our members to do something. But yeah, we are a young federation, and so yeah, we've we've been to South Korea, we've we've been to Brazil, and but it's exhausting, yeah. Going there. <laughs> it's not climate change friendly. <laughs> so. no, 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 no. But for instance, we we are accredited since a few months to go to the climate uh, t uh, to the climate uh, uh, to the COP uh, meetings, um, and we were planning to go to Scotland this year, but. We declined to go to Chile, and then it was in Madrid, and then our, our Spanish members, they, they did. In Paris, we, we organized a very big event. 450 people came there. We had Ségolène Royal, who was the minister at that time. Uh, we had very high uh, officials, and we had a very good event there. So we, we are looking at global level, but we are not organized at the global level so far. And we have the intention to do this, but yeah, it's always time and, and money and yeah. Okay. Alex, uh, a final, final one, because we have already taken almost two hours of Duke's time. So a short and final one. Yeah, it's, I'm sorry, it's just the audio. I couldn't hear you said Josh Roberts works for, for who? For RISCO. Our, our federation, yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so that was a short one. Yeah. Okay, um, I would like uh, really to thank you very much for your time today and for um, all the inputs I get.